Good morning. This is Tyler Crone with the 36th District Democrats. We are so delighted to be in conversation this morning with Council Member Tanya Wu, who is a candidate for re-election for the citywide city council seat. Welcome, Tanya. Over to you to introduce yourself, and thank you. Hi, thank you. My name is Tanya Wu. Uh, I am a proud PCO from the 37th District. Um, and like you, my views are shaped by my life experiences. My family immigrated here in 1887. I lived most of my life in South Seattle. I was raised in Beacon Hill, and today I reside in the Rainier Valley. I grew up working in my family's small business, which had locations in Wallingford, Hughes District, Chinatown. But wherever my work has taken me across Seattle, one passion has always remained the same, and that is lifting the voices of those who are marginalized. I am deeply involved in the Chinatown International District, which is one of the poorest neighborhoods in the city and on the nation's most endangered neighborhood list. I have fought against continued discrimination there against a government that wasn't meant or made for people of color and trying to make those changes from the inside. For four years, I have run a volunteer group called the CID Community Watch, which I consider the alternatives to policing. We walk the streets at night, providing mutual aid to our unhoused residents. We connect people to resources, and I have administered Narcan and performed CPR. Building affordable housing is also something I know about. I am an affordable housing developer and provider. I helped renovate and restore the Louisa Hotel into workforce apartments so that no one is forced to pay rent they cannot afford. So complex issues demand a hands-on solution from leading community watch patrols to organizing against racial discrimination, building workforce housing, and even administering Narcan on the streets. I've taken direct action. You deserve compassionate, pragmatic, hardworking leadership that understands our most vulnerable communities. And every day I strive to bring hands-on solutions to the city and fulfill that commitment to our constituents. Thank you. And if you have um, any questions, I would love to take them. Thank you so much, Councilmember Wu. Our first question this morning will be asked by Laura Marie. Hi, uh, if elected, to which standing committees of the city council will you seek appointment and what special qualifications do you bring to the ongoing work of those committees? Yes, if elected, um, well, the council committees, I believe are set. Um, and right now uh, they are Seattle City Lights, um, Arts and Culture and Sustainability. And so um, right now I'm learning all of the intricate details of CL City Lights in terms of how our market works in terms of energy, uh, learning about how, you know, today it's it's such a beautiful day, but that doesn't bode well in terms of our, our snow caps and how our hydroelectric dams are working in terms of producing electricity for constituents. And so I believe there are a lot of really interesting details to delve into, and I'm very excited to be doing that work. Um, in terms of sustainability, there weren't very many meetings last year. And so making sure that every single month that there is some sort of conversation, presentation from the Office of Sustainability to make sure that we keep those conversations going and we are aware of what's happening. There are a lot of really great things happening. We have the building emission standards coming, um, the rulemaking going forward. Um, currently also arts and culture. I'm a dancer, I'm a performer. I grew up as a theater person. And so I'm very excited to be able to bring forth and talk about the creative economy and how coming after pandemic, we can revive the arts and cultural um, organizations who, who define the life and soul of the city of Seattle. And so very excited to be doing that work. Also, um, the committees that I also am a part of are the Housing and Homelessness Committee, um, Department of Neighborhoods, Libraries, Education Committee, um, and my experiences there is, you know, I have developed and provided affordable housing. And so bringing that experience, that insight onto the council has been really valuable for me um, in being able to talk about legislation going forward, especially with a comprehensive plan. Um, I also sit on the transportation committee regarding, you know, we just passed the transportation plan, but, you know, we're on the levy right now. So making sure that all voices are being heard going forward. Um, I'm also, in terms of other committees, I believe um, for the next year, those are set. But the one committee I wish I could have been on is the Public Safety Committee. Um, that is something I would seek appointment on. And my experience there is the grand, the ground, on the ground experience from working on uh, Community Watch. We are still out there every week 
walking the streets. So we see what's happening. We see what's going on. And, you know, there's, we, we build trust and connections amongst our unhoused neighbors. And so we'll love to, you know, use that experience of, and continue bringing it on to council. Thank you. Let's move to our next question from Alex W. Yeah. Uh, what steps will you take to ensure that the city remains safe for all, including Black, Indigenous, and LGBTQ plus people, while keeping police accountable to elected leadership and community? Yes, and that is really promoting alternatives to policing. I love the CARE team, the CARE department under dual dispatch with Chief Amy Smith. She's right now operating a team of six. So we'll love to see the expansion of that program. Um, we'll love to, you know, expand diversion and make sure, you know, that is funded. Um, you know, the budget is a moral document and going into a budget deficit year, it's going to be very tough. But I am excited to be able to use the experience I have dealt with in terms of trying to find people shelter at 8 p.m. on a Friday night, very difficult. How do we make sure that, you know, there are resources available in the evenings and not just during the day um, in extreme weather events when it's uh, really cold, really warm. We are out there trying to get people into a warming shelters. Um, the effects of climate change are really evident. And so working in community, on the ground, using those experiences and how we can expand city services, especially when it comes to um, making sure that these programs are able to continue and have sustainable funding and not having to come back every year asking for funding, working with our federal partners or state partners to see, make sure that it, it's that funding is not only here, but statewide. Thank you so much. Our next question will be asked by Barbara. Thank you. How will you ensure the city has an updated climate action plan and what specific actions would you prioritize to get us back on track to meeting Seattle's Green New Deal goals. Yes, I'm really excited um, to a couple of weeks ago, we just confirmed um, a the Green New Deal team, the commission members, um, and I made sure that they all had time to tell their story. It was so amazing to hear about all of the equitable projects and development coming in into very many of our communities of color. Um, and so making sure that those stories and these issues are front and center, especially in committee meetings, make sure that there's time to have conversations. There are a lot of really great projects going forward. I grew up in South Seattle, Beacon Hill. Um, we are surrounded and boxed in by I-5, the industrial area, um, and stadiums. And so we have the lowest amount of tree canopy as well as District 1 and District 5. And so how do we get to 30% tree canopy? We're not there yet, we're very close, but we we'll love to reach our goals. Um, looking at to make sure that, you know, Green New Deal funding um, and Jumpstart, you know, we're all gonna be fighting for our, 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 our committee's funding. And so making sure that we're working together to make sure that these projects are able to be carried out, especially with our climate resiliency hubs, um, looking at how are we able to bring in more trees, bring us closer carbon neutral, transportation levy, transportation plan, how do we electrify our city's fleets, and especially fighting the state level to make sure that we're able to retain the climate commitment plan that's going to be on ballot. I mean, that's really important, making sure that, you know, those credits are going to communities of color to be able to get us closer to our climate, our carbon neutral goals. And so I talked about BEPS, the building emissions program, that's something we're going to closely look at. Um, and especially, how do we convert our buildings from gas to electricity? And, you know, something I've been hearing uh, doorbelling last year was a lot of our immigrants, refugees, communities, um, people who don't speak English, people who are further away from the government don't realize that there are certain restrictions on laws when it comes to cutting down trees. There is resources and help from converting your homes from uh, gas, electricity. And so how do we make sure that those communities are furthest away from government have access to those resources and are aware that we all have to work together to, to get to our climate goals? Thank you. Our last prepared question this morning will be asked by Shep. The city has been in a homelessness state of emergency since 2015, 
yet our homelessness in this crisis has not receded. What are we doing wrong and what steps will you take to address the crisis? Well, I think we are, we have a good start. I would love to see more um, community building uh, trust and how we do outreach and engagement with our in-house residents. Um, I think that's something that many of us talk about. Many people do find housing, but they go back and into the encampments because that's where their community is. That's where their friends are. So how do we look at building community? Um, and, you know, with encampments and with, you know, we see on Tolkien Jackson, we see at Third Pike and Pine, that's their community. So how do we foster that community? But in a way where it's, it's um, building trust among service providers, because I think a lot of people have lost that trust. They've been through the cycle. Um, a lot of times case managers, case workers um, are only with them to a certain point, in which case case managers, case workers switch. And so that trust building is not always there. There is that one person to help somebody along their journey. And so making sure that we have those relationships, which when, you know, my work on the community watch is making sure we build those trusting relationships. We we hear people's concerns, we know their story, um, and we're able to build those connections. So when they're ready to to move on, when they're ready to to move into housing, or they're ready to seek help, that you know we are there to help facilitate that journey. And you know many people invite us over when they find housing, and it's and they come visit us and they say hi. And so that's always amazing. So I think building that trust, building that community is something we really have to think about. Um, when there is sweeps, unfortunately, you know, uh, social workers come out and do that work and trying to build up a connection with people like three months before, two weeks before. It's different depending on, you know, which agency is in charge of that area. But how are we continuously building those connections, building that trust? We're continuously out there getting to know people. They see us, they trust us. I think it's something we really have to think about. And so it's things like not, not just housing first, but housing plus, where those services are tied in and they are continuous and they follow people throughout their journey. And I think that's something that's missing currently and something we definitely need to think about. Thank you. We'll now move to follow-ups. We'll work to keep these as tight as we can. Um, and we appreciate you being with us. Dawn, I see your hand first. Oh, Don, you're gone. Mute. Oh, yeah. Hi, Tanya. Hang I in. put in the chat, too, for you to read um, the question as I ask it. Um, transit station locations have been passionately debated in West Seattle and Chinatown International District, and sound transit and city officials have largely overlooked an area that would benefit from the rail the most, White Center, SeaTac, Des Moines, and Burien. What will you do to ensure that the rail will eventually reach largely Latino, Black, and Southwest and Southeast Asian diasporas to access jobs and services in the city? That's the other committee I wish I had got when able to be on the sound <laughs> transit committee. Mm -hmm. um, this is something I have been fighting and working on for years, um, uh, specifically within the China International District and setting of that station, because that would be the connector station in terms of Bellevue and having a one seat ride to many of our uh, you know, communities that won't be diverted to Westlake to get to the airport. And so it's a very nuanced situation. But the one issue that I've been talking about and wanting to give light on is, you know, making sure all communities are being heard, making sure that Sound Transit is doing the outreach and engagement, not just with the CID, but all of the communities along line one, um, and especially reaching out to communities that are not along line one, but that are about to go into White Center, Burien, Ballard. Everyone has a voice, and I don't believe that outreach and engagement has been done just yet. I think it's close but that still needs to happen. Thank you so much. Our next follow-up will be from Jeremy. Um, I, I also posted my question in the chat. You mentioned one of your earlier answers, the tra the renewal of the transportation levy. Um, as you already know, in response to some of the earlier concerns voiced about Mayor Harrell's initial proposal, a new larger levy was proposed this week. Does this new proposal go far enough? And overall, do you support this new proposal? I'm still reviewing the proposal. Um, and so I believe there was a lot of work, a lot of research that went into this proposal. And um, 
So I am still reviewing it. Um, I, I believe we do need to create grand goals for us to try and reach. We are asking money from constituents. And I something I'm really interested in is seeing the results of the last transportation levy. If those investments that voters have made has returned. And so looking at the results is, did that work? Did that go far enough? And how do we use that to measure our next levy and making sure that the measurements of success are there, the metrics are there, and that we're able to meet it and use money, especially to, to make sure that voters that you are satisfied with the results. I think inflation was a big issue with this new levy. And so that's why costs may have gone up. And so looking at to making sure that, you know, those projects that are cited, having more sidewalks are able to benefit everybody. And so um, I am still reviewing the levy and plan to, to really delve into it. I know that the committee meeting on Tuesday, transportation, will there will be a briefing and we're going to delve in deep and do that work. Thank you. Our next follow-up will be from Alex Beharan. Thank you, Council Amber. And I just posted my question in the chat for you too. Um, but what steps will you take to improve police accountability in the city, especially like, given the context of the SPA contract that is still being uh, discussed? Yes, I am not on that committee. <laughs> so um, I know that accountability um, negotiation is still ongoing. Um, and I, I chat with many of our fellow council members who are on that committee, and, and that's a really important piece. And so with my community watch group, we we listen to the scanners and whenever there is a police call, we show up because we want to make sure that there's translation services available. And we also want to make sure that, you know, we stand there and we film to make sure that everyone's treated equitably. And so police accountability is an important aspect and something I believe will be well negotiated. And I have hope and I have faith and I know it's still ongoing, so I can't really say much more. Thank you so much. Dawn, I see your hand up. Do you have a second question? I do, um, and I put it in the chat as well. Um, thank you for telling us of your creative um, um, efforts and that you are an artist as also a creative. I wanted to say that Seattle's creative ecology contributes nearly 20% of the GDP and as part of the greater 65% of revenue. Um, creative industries are getting more support from the county rather than the city of Seattle. What will you do to support many venues, museums, studios, and galleries facing declining city support? Yes, I'm working very closely with many organizations, especially a director came with the um, Arts and Culture Commission. And um, we are working on a round table the next couple of weeks where we're bringing in um, art organizations to talk about the creative economy. I know arts has had a rough time during the pandemic and that we're still trying to recover. There are a lot of art organizations who are just struggling. Um, we are, many of us talk about the renaissance of arts and culture and how are we able to help these groups thrive. And so we are having a state of the arts, of the arts <laughs> um, in, the, in the next couple of weeks. I, I, I'll, I'll definitely let you know when we have that committee meeting. But you know, the Arts and Culture Commission did a study on, or a poll, a survey on how many organizations, not just large ones like the Fifth, more intimate, but the little smaller ones as well, and seeing how they're doing it across the board. Everyone is just, you know, just trying to do the best for their organizations. And so making sure that that is forefront in our conversations, especially in our committee, and making sure that, you know, we are supporting the arts, especially ahead of FIFA soccer, we want FIFA Soccer to do what the World's Fair did for Seattle and making sure that arts and culture is forefront and that when people visit, they are able to see the many wonderful things that Seattle has to offer in our arts and culture sphere and our creative economy. And so would love to be able to facilitate that going forward. And I believe I'm sitting at meetings with Visit Seattle and other organizations to promote that, not only within the tourism economy, but also within the local city as well. Thank you so much. This concludes the formal part of our interview with you. So we will end our recording here.